And we are live. Five, four, three, two, one. Testing. Live. Yeah. Yep. Welcome, everybody, to our, um, I don't know which uh, journal club number it is right now, four, five, six, seven, three. Um, we are doing a paper that's a little different from the papers we've done uh, last time and that this is a review paper. So all the other papers we've done uh, until this point have been primary papers that have kind of drilled down deeply into a particular, um, either a particular technology or a particular facet of, of aging research. Uh, but this paper right now that we'll be doing is um, a, a very cool paper. It summarizes a lot of disparate information throughout the field of aging research and longevity. And the paper that we will be covering is, drum roll please, scroll up, The Hallmarks of Aging um, by Carlos Lopez Auten, Maria Blasco, Linda Partridge, Manuel Serrano, and Guido Kramer. Um, and it's a really good review paper that um, basically goes through pretty much all, except for, for one that we'll be discussing shortly, um, aspects of aging and the things that can potentially go wrong or do go wrong as organisms age. And it does a good job of getting into uh, some of the specifics of each one aspect. And you should be able to see uh, this wheel um, and this wheel here encapsulates nine hallmarks of aging, and there's a tenth one we'll cover. That's not on this wheel. And these are basically all the different areas of research that uh, aging researchers have been focusing on, and all of the different things that potentially go wrong and do go wrong as um, most organisms, certainly mammalian organisms, uh, grow old and uh, eventually die. So um, we'll use the one definition of aging being that uh, your probability of death goes up as time elapses. So that can encompass a lot of different things. And certainly each of these things in this um, pie chart here uh, will contribute to this probability of death going up um, as time elapses. So not only will we go over these hallmarks, but we'll also go over some potential um, therapeutic directions for perhaps, you know, if not all, then most of the hallmarks and uh, uh, see how we can target these one by one and, uh, you know, see if there's perhaps an additive effect of various therapies. So what we're going to do first is um, I'm just going to kind of briefly go through all nine of these um, just very briefly. And then we're going to uh, take them one by one and we'll all chime in. So right now, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, so joining us here, uh, we have Steve Hill. Uh, we have uh, two researchers, um, Sven, what's your last name? I, you know, I'm gonna screw it up and I'm gonna, I don't wanna even make a joke. Uh, Bill Tres. Bill Tres. And we have Victor Bjork. And uh, Victor, you're special. You've done a lot of research in uh, in crosslinking. Is that correct? Oh, that's Sven. That's on. Oh, that's Sven. Yeah. Uh, Victor, what was your what was your emphasis on? On uh, aging. Well, I have worked with uh, uh, C C elegance, for example. C elegance, aging in C elegance. Okay, very good. Um, and where 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 are you guys um, calling in from right now? Uppsala in Sweden. Sweden and Belgium and Belgium. Excellent. And I'm in New York City, so I'm Oliver. And uh, Steve is somewhere in the UK, I think. An exotic and distant foreign place known as Luton. It's fantastic. And uh, joining us, we also have, uh, is that Asif? Asif? No? Yes? Hello. He caught her by surprise. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's vital. Otherwise, um, everything collapses. All right. Okay. So um, I guess introductions are uh, fairly short and are over. Um, if anybody wants to talk more about themselves, feel free to do so. Um, 
let's go back to the paper. Uh, share screen. Bing. Bam. All right. So, uh, so there's a lot of things that can go wrong with a cell that's aging, um, as things tend to break down over time. And uh, kind of looking at the top of this clock face, uh, so if we look all the way up at 12 o'clock, uh, maybe a little bit to 1 o'clock, we see genomic instability as one hallmark of aging. And of course, your genome is your prime repository of all the information that helps run the cell. So anything that um, goes amiss with your genome um, is going to degrade functions in the cell. And this is something that's been noted for a long time. Um, increased incidences of mutations that occur as cells uh, grow older. Um, and that leads to a number of different phenotypes, including an increased incidence of cancers as as people grow old. Um, there are also different types of um, accelerated aging uh, diseases uh, that do exhibit uh, genomic instability. Um, so we'll discuss some of those. Uh, following the clock downwards to about two o'clock, we have telomere attrition. Uh, most of us have heard about telomeres. They're basically the the ends of chromosomes, they're repetitive sequences that help basically maintain the chromosome ends. Uh, the analogy that people use is as a the cap at the end of shoelaces. Um, I think it's called an aglet or something like that. Um, so these ends are maintained by an enzyme uh, known as telomerase, which is really a complex. And it is a, basically it's a nucleoprotein uh, complex. It's uh, a protein that carries a little template of RNA that's used to re-extend the ends of linear chromosomes. Um, this was something noted a long time ago, um, theoretically, as the end replication problem. So when DNA replicates, it needs to start off with a little tiny primer that gets degraded, an RNA primer. And once the primer is laid down at the end of a chromosome um, and is removed, there's nothing for your regular DNA polymerase to latch onto and extend. So every time your cells divide, the ends shrink um, a segment at a time. And without telomerase being expressed or without any other type of mechanism, there are alternative mechanisms for telomere lengthening, but the normal mechanism is, is telomere mediated. Without that, the cells will um, start, stop dividing, and they will enter what's known as senescence. And uh, this is um, one way that cells can enter senescence. Uh, it's not the only way. And we'll talk about other ways that cells enter senescence. But when cells senesce, they do bad things to the body. Um, and uh, what else was I going to say about telomeres and telomere attrition? I've think. got something to add about telomeres as well. Yeah. One, one thing that people often forget is uh, they're not just a simple uh, replica, uh, replication counter. They also influence gene expression uh, via an effect called uh, telomere positioning um, over long distances or TPE old. Um, mm -hmm. So it kind of ties telomeres and the next hallmark together because the length of telomeres influences epigenetics and gene expression. So, so that's, that's, you know. So correct. And uh, going on to epigenetic alterations, that's telomere attrition and the connection with epigenetic alterations is something I, I, I studied a long time ago when I was in grad school with David Sinclair uh, using yeast as a model organism. And as uh, Steve pointed out, there's this telomere position effect where, um, Areas around telomeres and certainly around other um, areas of chromosomes are what are known as heterochromatic. They sil things that tend to be silenced there. What that means is if you put a gene close to telomeres, it will be uh, suppressed. And as telomeres shorten, that suppression goes away. So uh, this suppression is related to epigenetic alterations. And what are epigenetic alterations or what is the epigenome? Well, that's basically um, the code on top of your genetic code. Um, it's a little bit more malleable. Um, these are modifications that are chemical residues that are either attached to uh, particular bases of DNA, so usually have methyl groups attached, um, or they're modifications to the proteins. And in this figure, you see these two disks, and you see these are supposed to represent histone complexes. 
uh, an octamer of histone proteins with DNA wrapped around it, or you can get modifications to the histones themselves. Um, the epigenome, basically, if, if we want to expand the definition, it's any type of hereditable um, effect or marker that is non-genomically encoded. Uh, so you can, you can certainly, RNAs can play a role in epigenetic alterations. Um, and there's a lot of proteins that um, can modify the expression levels of transcripts throughout the genome. Um, and that's something that's crucial uh, to a multicellular organism. Without epigenetic changes that occur during development, we would just be one amorphous blob of cells, right? Instead of having over 200 distinct somewhat cell types. So that's the main reason why your neurons are neurons and they don't look like uh, white blood cells is because they have a different epigenome, um, even though the genome is mostly the same, almost entirely the same. And epigenomic, epigenetic alterations are another hallmark of aging. Uh, you don't want, you know, your neuron turning into uh, a blood cell, definitely. And uh, so, unfortunately, certain epigenetic changes um, do occur as we age. So that's one hallmark. Uh, going down the clock, we have loss of proteostasis. So uh, proteins. So that image you see there is a bunch of alpha helices of some sort of globular protein. And proteins have distinct pattern, shapes and patterns, and which are referred to as conformations. And they can undergo changes in these conformations. And um, proteins are essentially the most of the body's nanomachinery. They keep a lot of things functioning. Um, they perform structural roles. Um, if you look at a human being, what you're looking at mostly is protein in the form of keratin. So um, proteins, um, to paraphrase Ron Burgundy, are sort of a big deal. Um, so you want proteins to be in their proper shape, and their proper shape dictates their function for the most part. And proteins um, misfold. And there are other proteins that help those proteins fold back uh, into the right shape. And if proteins misfold too much, um, bad things can happen. Uh, proteins can stick to one another. They can form aggregates. Um, so not only loss of function, but you can, you can get secondary toxic effects. Um, so um, that's another problem that happens as, as cells age. Then there's deregulated nutrient sensing. Um, so this one is something we're going to have to tease apart a bit. Um, so this basically focuses on uh, nutrient sensing and the insulin signaling pathway. And this is something that's uh, very well conserved amongst many organisms. And we have a lot of mechanisms in place to um, essentially sense the presence of nutrients. Um, that's something that cells need to do to survive. So that's an ancient mechanism. And deregulation of it. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, calorie and dietary restriction and how that basically ties into nutrient sensing. Um, but that's not the whole story. So the signaling that happens via these pathways could actually alter um, the metabolic functions of a cell. And if you have improper sensing, uh, this is sort of can act as a, as a throttle that can accelerate aging or, or slow it down, so to speak. Then following the clock face um, upwards, we have mitochondrial uh, dysfunction. As most of all, or all of you know, mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell, right? That's where the vast bulk of your adenosine triphosphate is synthesized. Mitochondria also play a crucial role in um, regulating uh, apoptosis in the cell. So if the cell goes um, haywire, uh, mitochondria play a key role in, in um, cell program cell death. Uh, so anything that happens to mitochondria is going to be um, devastating to the cell if it's negative, because um, your cell needs a continuous source of ATP. And not only a continuous source of ATP, but it needs these, this, um, this electron transport chain that generates the ATP has to function smoothly without glitches. Otherwise, uh, you'll start generating too many byproducts that are not good for the cell, like reactive oxygen species, which will uh, 
basically can tie into problems that are in the other facets of this wheel, such as loss of proteostasis, right? Next, um, we have cellular senescence, uh, which is symbolized by this maple leaf, which probably is supposed to symbolize uh, the leaves in fall um, as they undergo a programmed kind of um, death response and fall off. Um, and cellular senescence uh, ties into, we talked about one aspect which can uh, certainly um, cause cellular senescence, and that's telomere attrition. And basically, this is a way, a cell's way of kind of shutting itself down, shutting its proliferation down uh, when things go uh, awry inside. So uh, if your telomeres get too short and your cells just keep replicating, uh, what's going to happen is the telomeres are going to, ends are going to be recognized as damaged. Um, you can get ends of chromosomes fusing. You can get something called aneuploidy, um, and the cells can become um, quickly cancerous. So cellular senescence is, is really a body's preventative uh, mechanism to prevent that from happening. But um, it's also a bad thing in that the cells, once they senesce, they kind of stay put. And um, when they stay put, they actually, um, other things are going wrong and they have problems with uh, signaling with their neighbors and uh, they can actually induce a, um, a bad environment, so to speak, um, in cells that, have, that are surrounding them. So we'll look at some therapies that target uh, senescent cells. Uh, next up, we have stem cell exhaustion. So um, stem cells um, is a term that most of us are familiar with and there's many different types of stem cells. This field is still, uh, I don't wanna say fairly nascent, but you know, we're still trying to define what are all the stem cells, the somatic stem cells in the body. And uh, essentially the way the body um, maintains itself is differentiated cells don't divide and create more differentiated cells. Really what you have is instead a pool of fairly undifferentiated cells in various uh, niches, which are areas in the body. And when uh, cells need to be replaced, these cells um, are able to replicate and divide and maintain their stemness while um, creating cells that are going along the path of differentiation. So, um, so for example, you have stem cells that are muscle satellite cells that sit around in your, in your, um, uh, in your muscles. And if you have any damage occurring, um, they'll tend to replicate, and then those replicated cells will differentiate to um, fully, fully developed uh, uh, muscle, striated or otherwise. Um, so if you run out of stem cells, um, that's a bad thing. You can't maintain the homeostasis of an organ, right? So you can't, you, you can't, uh, you have to have a constant turnover, and if there's no more turnover, then you basically your organ will atrophy and um, homeostasis will go quickly downhill. Um, and it only takes one organ to basically kick the bucket before the whole system goes. So uh, stem cell exhaustion, um, there was an interesting conference I was at a little over, I think about two years ago at the New York Academy of Sciences with, uh, with Keith, Keith Camito, our El Presidente, and uh, <clears throat> They, the interesting thing about this conference was they were looking at diseases which aren't normally connected with aging, but um, had some aspect, had this aspect, which is stem cell exhaustion, to do with aging. And it was interesting to see, you know, these kind of links being made. For example, um, HIV, people who have, are, are, are chronically infected with a viral infection, um, there's a tremendous turnover of your white blood cells, particularly your helper T cells, as they start basically dying off. And eventually that population depletes. And once that population depletes, uh, your immune system collapses and um, you get all sorts of opportunistic infections. So um, that's what one thing that would happen if let's say your stem cells for your hematopoietic system that creates your blood, all the blood cells were to collapse. And certainly if we have cells that produce pancreatic beta islet cells deplete, then you have type one, um, you have di type one diabetes. So you can have stem cell exhaustion happening in different um, parts, of the, parts of the body. And this is something that has been noticed in, in studies to occur in that you have a, a basically a lowering in the amounts of stem cells um, in particular uh, organs. And last, we have altered intracellular communication. 
Um, well, if you're having all these other problems occurring, I guess it's not too much of a surprise that you're going to have altered intracellular communication, uh, especially if you have cellular senescence. Um, and this, again, sort of, to me, ties into cellular senescence in that once you have these defects occurring, your cells kind of no longer start acting the way they're supposed to be acting. And the, this missed guided signals they're giving can actually promote problems in their surroundings. So that kind of ex exacerbates the effect of one cell and sort of propagates it to other cells. Um, and the 10th hallmark, which uh, we'll talk about um, a little bit more, uh, but that's not on this wheel, uh, is crosslinks. And this is something that happens in uh, not your cells, but in outside of your cells in uh, kind of a region or a milieu that's called the extracellular matrix. And that's essentially this incredibly complex glue that holds together your entire body. Without the ECM, you would just fall apart. Um, it had, there's many components to the extracellular matrix. There's collagen, there's proteoglycans, there's hyaluronic acids, there's all sorts of, um, all sorts of things. Um, the ECM not only holds your cells together, but it in itself uh, performs uh, uh, vital signaling roles. And um, the ECM itself is being explored um, in many uh, regenerative medicine laboratories as a means to um, help regrow tissues because it acts also as a scaffold and tells the cells where to go uh, when there's damage occurring. So, you know, I kind of liken it to if you look at a building and you have a, a, the steel scaffolding and you have the bricks and each brick is a cell, um, the extracellular matrix would be like scaffolding that directs the bricks where to go. So it's as if the, you were to throw the bricks at the scaffolding and they would find where find their right places to go because the scaffolding is, is also doing the building. So the ECM is... is um, is uh, rather complex and there's a lot of macromolecules there whose kind of signaling functions are as yet being teased out because um, they're much more complex than um, polymers such as DNA or proteins. Um, so let's stop sharing here. So those are all the hallmarks of aging that this kind of rather massive review attempts to tackle. Um, took me longer to get through them than I expected, actually. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, we're not going to obviously thoroughly explore every one of them, uh, only, you know, to, I guess, to our satisfaction, and then we'll move on to the next one. Um, so I don't want it to be, it's not going to be just me talking. It's going to be everybody on this panel. Um, and um, I think I'm going to, does anybody have a favorite hallmark to kick it off from, or should we start and just start going by the, in order of figures? Or, you know, I don't think it really matters which, which way we go. Follow the wheel. Follow the wheel. Follow the wheel. All right. Follow the wheel. Like, follow the yellow brick road. We should follow the wheel. Okay, follow the wheel. So, first thing on um, at just to the right of 12 o'clock is genomic instability. Um, I think that was actually one of the first hallmarks that was studied uh, with regards to aging, right? So one of the earliest theories of aging posited that you have uh, just a accumulation of mutations um, as cells replicate. Um, that was before stem cells were, were discovered. So um, this still plays a role, um, not the only role. So let's go back to screen sharing here. Okay. So let's go to figure two. So figure two tries to encapsulate uh, uh, all the, let me see, let me move this thing to the side here. Sorry. Uh, all the different uh, genomic, well, I guess they have, let me see if they have next figure. No, it's just, yeah, okay. So we'll use that figure. So figure two actually looks at genomic and epigenetic uh, alterations. So I guess uh, we can take a look at figure 2A and all the things that can go wrong and do go wrong with DNA. Um, and uh, we can break this figure down into two parts. One is the damage and one is, uh, and on the bottom in green are the repair pathways. So there's mechanisms in place that the cell has evolved uh, through natural selection uh, to take care of these problems, which um, spontaneously occur and, you know, 
either you know endogenously or exogenously because of just the environment cells are in. Uh, we're all aware of exogenous damage that can occur uh, through various chemicals, um, ultraviolet light um, causing thymidine dimers, radiation, ionizing radiation that could cause breaks. So all this stuff comes externally and also internally, right? So reactive oxygen species I briefly mentioned, these are um, uh, elements that have an, uh, or molecules that have an extra electron that's very reactive. Um, these are generated uh, quite extensively in mitochondria. There's replication errors, so DNA is not replicated, um, you know, perfectly, uh, although the error rate is very, very low. Um, if you particularly have mutations in your repair pathways, um, then you're going to be at a very high risk of, of uh, cancers and other types of genetic lesions. Um, and also a variety of spontaneous reactions that uh, that that naturally occur um, that can lead to things um, that are referred to here as DNA lesions. And this is a nice summary of all the different things that can kind of um, get screwed up with your chromosomes. Uh, we mentioned telomere shortening, and um, and underneath are the mechanisms that help fix this problem, right? So we mentioned telomerase as being one me method. So here we have a highly stylized view of a, I guess a, of, I guess that's a that's that's a that's a chromosome that's a that's a pair of chromatids I would guess right with a with a centromere in the in the center. Um, kind of going from left to right, you have base damages, which are basically damage uh, to uh, your nitrogenous bases, your A's, T's, G's, and C's. And you have a uh, whole pathway such as base excision repair uh, that can cut out the actual base itself, um, leaving the strand intact and replacing it. There's adduct formation. I mentioned these thymine dimers that can occur. Um, there's nucleotide excision repair um, that can occur to basically um, remove these. There's interstrand crosslinks, um, so we have a variety of mechanisms, and a lot of these mechanisms overlap. So you'll see nucleotide excision repair uh, can get rid of these crosslinks. So these are just uh, covalent bonds that aren't supposed to be there, as well as homologous recombination-mediated repair. There's spindle errors. So when cells undergo mitosis, they all line up in this very intricate um, pattern. Um, and you need the chromosomes, uh, you know, you need chromosome one to go in one direction and for mom and chromosome one, or well, chromosome one that's duplicated with mom and dad uh, being the donors to one cell and then the other duplicated chromosome one to the other cell. Um, if you have some problem with things lining up at the metaphase uh, plate, then um, the spindle is basically these uh, microtubules which latches onto the centromere which is this box here and um, it'll pull and if things aren't lined up properly what you can get is you can get uh, problems with ploidy which is the amount of chromosomes a cell gets so a cell could get uh, less chromosomes or more chromosomes so there's this spindle uh, arrest checkpoint that occurs and that's that's a crucial checkpoint in mitosis to prevent these errors from occurring there's double strand breaks, so that's a rather severe breakage, right? You have a cleavage right through the through the chromosome. I guess this is I guess this is supposed to be one chromosome right now because it's a double strand break. I'm just trying to see if how I can interpret this. Yeah, okay. So this is this is supposed to be a double helix with two strands, and again, you have two pathways: homologous recombination and non-homologous end joining that can glue this together. Um, one is more precise than the other. Um, and mismatches. So your polymerases don't always um, excise the wrong base. So you have pathways such as mismatch repair that will get rid of these mismatches. Um, and these are, this is basically all the things that can go wrong, um, kind of summarized. And these things, the number of these things going wrong as time uh, elapses uh, goes up. Um, especially if you have mutations also accumulating in these pathways that help repair it. So it's sort of a positive feedback loop. And telomere shortening um, is itself, you know, in many studies has been closely associated with, with health and uh, aging. So organisms that have longer telomeres than average are healthier than um, the same organisms with shorter telomeres than average. Um, so these are things that can go wrong specifically um, with your genome, 
And underneath it, we have things that can go wrong with uh, the chemical cues that are kind of overlaid over this um, DNA. And this is your epigenome. And um, I was talking to somebody um, at a laboratory that studies epigenetic modifications. And um, they were telling me that I didn't go through all the different ones, but usually you hear about DNA methylation. You hear about acetylation. Um, but uh, they were able to find like upwards of 50 or more different chemical groups added to DNA. And I haven't gotten through all of them. This was at the Mason lab at, at Cornell, uh, Wild Cornell. So I was actually shocked that there were so many different groups. And, and so we only know sort of the functions of, of a few of them. So um, this is a whole new language that is, you know, yet to be, dis yet to be discovered and, and interpreted. Um, so okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, so any, any comments before I go into epi the epigenome instability? Well, the, the big question really is, um, for me, is, is DNA damage significant during normal human lifespan? Some, some people suggest it is, such as the, the authors of Hallmarks of Aging, mm -hmm. and some authors um, suggest that it isn't relevant during normal human lifespan. Mm -hmm. I mean, no doubt we've got to find tools to fix it, Either way, whoever's right, we still need to be able to fix it because if we're going to be living longer lives, we still need the toolkit. But the question is, is it or isn't it relevant during current lifespan? I mean, you know, there's no right or wrong answer here. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it could be that uh, it doesn't play a significant role, but if these, if, if, um, these pathways uh, are not that repair, are themselves deficient. Um, there are, you know, progeroid illnesses that certainly um, exhibit many phenotypes of accelerated aging that um, have noticeable genomic instability occurring. Um, so, for example, um, kind of the 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 one that most people are familiar with is Hutchinson Guilford progeria, which is a, a defect in uh, the lamin A gene, which is required for proper nuclear architecture, which is also then, prop then required to kind of maintain the stability of chromosomes, uh, I believe, uh, the way they're tethered. So, um, you know, it's debatable how much of a role this plays in normal aging. If, you're, if your repair pathways are still pretty functional, you know, um, well into old age, so if your, your pathways, you know, if that's are still maintained, then, you know, it probably doesn't play a major role. Um, however, you know, the incidences of cancer do go up as we grow older. Um, that could be a combination of both genetic instability as well as epigenetic instability. Um, since there's, you know, there's certainly cancers that are a result of epigenetic uh, remodeling defects um, and not um, genetic defects per se, which would be um, some of the, you know, defects I just mentioned, uh, but rather to the epigenome. Um, so how much of each actually plays a role in aging? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, I, percentage I, one. I, I just want to point out that Werner's syndrome is, of course, also a very good example in this context. Exactly. So Werner's syndrome uh, affects, um, I believe, a, a DNA helicase, which yeah. is required to, to, to unwind DNA during, um, during replication. So, so cer certainly if you have defects in components that maintain the integrity of the genome, you will get um, humans that do exhibit, um, not all, but certainly a, a sizable amount of, of phenotypes that uh, mimic um, a, a prematurely aged individual. And of course, there's always debate uh, as to, you know, how, how well does this reflect proper, you know, real aging that happens in, in, in normal people. Um, it could be that that the reason you only see certain aspects of the phenotype mimicked in these progeroid illnesses is because uh, the overemphasis might be on genomic instability rather than some of the other hallmarks. That could be, you know, so in normal, quote unquote, normal aging, you have a little bit of all of these things going wrong versus a lot of some of these things going wrong in some some of these genetic models. I'll just throw that out there.
No, I think that's a fair um, it's a fair comment. And um, you know, progeria. Some people argue that it is it isn't real aging, as you say, <clears throat> but it does share many characteristics. And there was a study recently where they looked at gene expression patterns in progeria and also normal aging, and there were there were a lot of similarities. So you know, I wouldn't sort of discount it straight away. Um, it could be, as you say, just very focused aging on one particular hallmark. Mm-hmm. There are other diseases, certainly, that seem to accelerate aging in one particular area. Diabetes is another example, um, with the accelerated appearance of um, uh, AGEs. But more on that later, right, mm-hmm. before we go off down the primrose path talking about something yeah. else. But yeah, I think it's a fair comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah that's something that... Um... I think that may have been the first time I, I, I mentioned that as, as a thought. Maybe somebody else has written about that, but you know, it, it, uh, I, think, I think I'll do a little bit more reading to see if, if, if somebody else has made that suggestion or if there's been experiments along that line. Um, so, uh, you know, so it could be that uh, both sides are right, as always, right? So, no, it's not real aging. Yes, it does reflect an aspect of aging. Um, okay, so let's um, go back to screen sharing mode and start talking about the epigenome a little bit. There we go. Okay. Does that uh, look clear? Big enough to see the figure two? Okay. Uh, so as we mentioned, epigenetic modifications um, – are also required for, well, they're required for a number of things. For example, they're required, we mentioned, to maintain differentiated cell status uh, in your body. And this is your primary mechanism that will um, determine which cell uh, develops into, a, you know, a particular s- specific cell, pancreatic beta islet cell versus um, an alpha islet cell versus, uh, you know, a cell in your retina. And, you know, if if I could use a very crude analogy, it says if, you know, your genome is a whole bunch of file cabinets and only some of them are open and the the epigenetic modifications are like kind of the tabs on particular files and the cell can essentially reference um, those specific tabs. And you have enzymes which mediate the status. And for the most part, you don't want these. So your genes are always switching on and off and, uh, you know, depending on, on what genes they are. Um, but for a number of genes, um, you don't want to mess with their status. You want to kind of set them to, to the point where they need to be and kind of lock them in. So um, these are the epigenetic modifications. And uh, uh, you, you pretty much want to maintain those same um, modifications throughout your life. Um, that's the goal. If they start to change, it's probably going to be for the worst. Uh, so definitely changes in these, um, these chemical modifications are seen um, in populations that are, are aging when you compare it to um, uh, youthful cohorts. And um, there's a lot of research now taking place in epigenetic modifications as a diagnostic for, you know, for uh, physiologic aging of individuals. And uh, some of these um, modifications uh, in this figure 2B um, one that's been studied for a long time is DNA methylation. And methylation in general correlates with, uh, depending on where it is, but in general it correlates with um, essentially, um, I believe, repressing genes activity. So you have um, increased methylation, gene activity goes down, um, and vice versa. Um, Then there's, so these methylations occur on basis specifically. Histone modifications are things that happen uh, on the histones themselves. Um, One classic modification is um, an acetyl group. Um, And that's something that was studied at the Sinclair lab and many other labs. uh, No doubt most people have heard of the sirtuin class of enzymes. These are histone deacetylases. Um, And deacetylation, acetyl groups basically help in general open chromatin to a more open state and deacetylation uh, is the opposite. It condenses chromosome. So you see these arrows basically pointing out to various changes. And chromatin remodeling, these are factors that actually promote the remodeling of chromatin. And what they mean by remodeling of chromatin is if you can sort of imagine chromatin as kind of a slinky 
that stretched out. Uh, I, I guess maybe some of you remember slinkies, which are these little like spring-like toys that go flopping down staircases. Um, so if you imagine compact chromosome to be a slinky in its kind of flattened state on top of the stairs, and as it opens up and starts bouncing down the stairs and kind of opening, um, those when it opens, that's when um, genes are accessible uh, to be expressed. Now, the problem with accessibility is that um, in a lot of cases, uh, those areas of the chromosome, uh, depending on where it is, um, the open state is a bit more fragile as well. Um, and these were studies that uh, I remember doing in the lab with yeast cells in particular, uh, where if you basically um, shut down uh, sirtuin activity and basically um, increase the acetylation status, then you have certain regions that are very repetitive, like the ribosomal DNA locus um, all of a sudden starts going haywire and starts um, excising bits of itself. Uh, so there's a lot of instability in repetitive sequences. Um, and that was uh, seen to be a contributing factor to at least um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae or yeast aging, right? Certainly, um, you know, that may be specific for yeast, but there might be um, other types of manifestations in, in other cells. So we can see with DNA methylation, global methylation in general goes down. Um, so, and in particular, and in particular regions, the local methylation goes up, right? And then we see histone modifications. These are all different histones. So this, these are abbreviations. So histone for K16, K just stands for lysine. So lysine 16, um, that's an acetyl group, I believe, and that's uh, 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 three methyl groups. So you have different changes happening there. And you have chromatin remodeling factors uh, that help condense chromatin go down. So the overall effect is you have um, this one box suggests more transcriptional noise, meaning you have more things being expressed and probably wrongly expressed. Um, RNA processing aberrations, impaired DNA repair um, because you've changed the architecture of the genes in many locations, and, and also chromosome instability, like I alluded to, if you have repetitive sequences and uh, they're decondensed, uh, they can become fragile and prone to recombination. Um, so this is a way that, um, so now we're, we're, you know, you have this bridge here between DNA um, stability or instability and chromatin remodel, because chromatin remodeling and, 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 epigen and the epigenome could affect the stability of the genome itself. Um, but not only the stability, it can also have more um, higher order effects, such as um, this transcriptional noise. So that can certainly lead to aberrant signaling. So the epigenome changes that occur, you know, in, in some sense are kind of a nexus uh, between genomic stability and a lot of the other things that can go wrong downstream um, because the epigenome is responsible for um, um, how genes are expressed. So stop sharing here. Thoughts, comments? Can we start talking about maybe potential therapeutics in this field? We, I, talk, I briefly said that you know, people are studying the epigenome as a particular diagnostic for aging, and also for chromosome stability, people are studying telomere lengths as a diagnostic for aging. So certainly older people in general have shorter telomeres in general, um, and uh, older people have certain uh, histone uh, modification changes in the epigenome as people grow older. Um, so, you know, one kind of useful tool would be as a diagnostic to see whether other therapeutics are working, right? If you could see, well, does the epigenome um, and the genome in the sense of telomere lengths, you know, is that reflected in a person's health span? Well, Horvath, um, Steve Horvath's um, aging clock, uh, epigenetic clock is probably the gold standard of biomarkers, as, as you, you will all know, um, and it is very, very accurate. Uh, epigenetic uh, methylation status correlates very strongly with uh, life expectancy and, and all kinds of things. It's uh, it's great. What can we do about it now? Well, you know that's another matter, and there are there are a few possible solutions because uh, I, uh, IPSC um, induced pluripotency uh, stem cells. Uh, when you 
take them out when you say adult cells and you use ispsc therapy it effectively resets these epigenetic uh, markers they're like you know methylation markers and when it's done using the four we we talked about this in previous mm -hmm. journal clubs going back to uh, to uh, may and june we talked about how they'd actually reset these these epigenetic markers in living animals you know late last year but it's one possible solution because we knew that it was possible to do in a dish when you take adult cells from a person put them in a dish and use these reprogramming factors and what it does is it, it resets the epigenetic profile and the cells become functionally younger and they behave like young cells again so obviously the next question is can we apply it to you know, in situ, in living animals. Yeah. And as, as we talked about before, yes, we can, because they did it with mice in December and again in January. Funny enough, it was Blasco that did it, one of the authors of this paper. And, and it, they, they even say in this paper, which is dated 2013, about epigenetics, there's a little note saying, we think this is what's going on with epigenetics, but so far... There's not enough preclinical data. Boom, there's your data. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was a bit of a smile when I saw those two papers in December and January, and I thought back to that little section in this paper where it said, we don't have enough evidence yet. And I, it was me, it was like a little light bulb. It was like, now you do. So it's, it's great. So the solution is we can possibly... Uh, you know, using signaling factors like the Yamanaka factors. Obviously, how we turn them on and off is is debatable. Um, you know, uh, Belmont believes that a drug approach is a safer way of doing it. Uh, I believe uh, George Church is talking about possibly using gene therapies, maybe CRISPR. You know, there are different ways we could do it, but we can potentially get those four pr reprogramming factors and introduce them in situ in humans obviously with appropriate safety clinical trials all of that's got to absolutely be done because it's you know this is dangerous stuff it's medicine sure but it's proof of concept in sure. uh in, in the fact that we've done it in a dish mm -hmm. and we've been doing it for about how long now over a decade we've been mm -hmm. re, re, resetting a epigenetic age for at least a decade probably sure. even longer and now we've done it in mice so we can see the way potentially forward here i mean has, has anyone got any thoughts about you know yamanaka factors where we transiently pulse them we don't switch them on all the time because if we switch them on all the time all the cells suddenly forget what they are and that would be a very bad idea yes but if you pulse it very very transiently it makes the the cells malleable but it doesn't change the cells but just enough jiggling this is a sort of a layman's analogy but it jiggles yeah. the cells enough to make them reset and i think that's really cool i mean i don't know if you guys have got any thoughts yeah on well that. i think i think you know before we start seeing i mean we start we're seeing in situ and i think both of us did a, a review of one of the papers right the blasco paper um so if anybody wants to check that out um we have that those reviews up in our blog right or is there we certainly do I'll, I'll, I'll go and fetch those now yeah. and uh so so i think for human trials I'm, i mean most likely you know in situ is going to be the i mean in in vitro is going to be the first way to go and if you know you basically have um re uh reprogram autologous stem cells you can then put them back into the body um and uh fix a potential organ that's depleted in certain cell types, uh, you know, the pancreas comes in mind. And uh, without any, you know, uh, graft rejection. And, uh, you know, this, this is something that um, I think is going to be probably the, the first uses of this technology. Um, obviously, the more kind of uh, extreme version would be some sort of therapy, which basically reprograms everything that needs to be reprogrammed in your body uh, while getting rid of all the bad stuff, which we'll talk about later, such as senescent cells. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's an exciting development. It really is um, that these, so, you know, it's exciting to me because it's 
strongly suggested that these epigenetic modifications, you know, uh, just are not just correlative, but causative, right? So, so it's not just that they're a marker for aging, but that they are themselves a hallmark of aging, right? That is causing aging. So if they are fixed, um, the cells become better. So I, I think that to me is the, that to me is the, you know, the key take home exciting point. Yeah, I've heard the analogy um, that the genome is, is, is not even as important as the epigenome. And you can think of the epigenome as kind of like a lens. So it's almost like, you know, when you get a magnifying glass uh, and, and, you, and you hold it up, you know, in the sun mm -hmm. and it focuses the sun. So you can almost, almost imagine the genome is the sun and the epigenome is that, that, that magnifying glass. So it's how you move and what uh, and what you do that change with the magnifying glass that changes the form, the function, or the focus. You know, I think that's really interesting. Um, if if I would have to sort of bet money on it, I would probably say that the epigenome or epigenetic changes are more important uh, at this point than actual um, DNA um, damage to the DNA. I might be wrong, but uh, there was a study. In fact, I published it today um uh, and it's on this page which is about epigenetic drift they've just um shown in another study that epigenetic drift status is a very strong predictor of mortality and it could potentially be a great uh, biomarker of aging and that caloric restriction um slows down that rate of epigenetic drift and quite frankly right now it's probably about the only thing we can do uh, you know everyday folks to actually slow it down while we wait for these wonderful approaches to arrive you know because yeah. obviously belmont and and other wonderful researchers are working on the solutions but we've got to hang in there i suppose i mean it's all right for for sven and victor you know i mean you know they're both young but me i I, I I better get on that caloric restriction. I'm pretty young. What are you talking about? Well, you guys are, you know. But I think I'm your age, I... though. <laughs> You're ruining the joke, Oliver. Oh. But, you know, I suppose I'll have to go on the salads. <laughs> but uh, what do you think, Victor? Do you fancy uh, going on the salad for a few extra years? Actually, I would if there was, like, solid proof, if I was, like, guaranteed uh, 100. But with uncertainty, then... Maybe not. <laughs> well, I have. Well, I mean, have a look. I have, no have a look at that paper uh, that I reviewed today because it definitely, definitely slows down in um, mouse, um, rhesus monkeys, and human blood cells. It definitely, absolutely slows down the rate of epigenetic drift. Hmm. Awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how my diet plan uh, is working out because I, I, I am taking your advice. I'm eating a, a hearty meat salad every day. And uh, that should do it, right? We're talking about meat salads, aren't we? No? Mm -hmm. The chicken Caesar, yeah? Oh, well, leafy greens. I think that's what we're talking about, leafy greens. Mm. But are we really talking about it? Because in uh, mice, I mean, it's quite uncertain as far as I know how much it really you know, slows aging in, in that sense uh, versus just preventing certain things. I mean, if you look in humans, for example, we know that Okinawa, people in Okinawa where they're appear to be a little bit calorie restricted, they live about four and a half years longer than in Sweden, for example, uh, but they have lower cancer and they have lower heart disease. But to what extent are you talking about slowing aging versus just cutting the risk for certain yeah. disease? Humans, we don't know. Really. I think the other, other thing that kind of um, muddies the waters a bit, right, is when they, when they feed mice ad libitum and calorie restricted, the argument is that, well, CR is normal, ad libitum is not normal, right? So it's the same with us. It's, it's, uh, we, we haven't evolved to drink a six pack of Coca-Cola every, every week, which is like 34, 300, well, it's a couple hundred grams of sugar. I drink that in a day. What Jeez. are you talking about? And, and, and the salad. <laughs> Don't forget the salad. And the salad. So, you know, I, I, I have a, have a liter of Coca-Cola and wash it down with a, with a club salad. Excellent. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, sounds about right. I'm not a medical doctor, but it sounds, sounds legit to me. Well, it's either the Coca-Cola or coffee. Remember, a, a, a wise person once told me a scientist is essentially a machine that processes caffeine and turns it into um, 
hypothesis. Yeah, that's I mean, a, that's, part, that, that's apparently the way it is. Yeah, it's partly right. Do we have any questions coming in from the either? We've we've had uh, a few. To come back to uh, something Steve said earlier, um, he said that um, a possible solution will be the Yamanaka fa factors. And that is kind of uh, dealing with the problem from a high level up solution. The other solution will be the low level solution, namely changing the expression or the activity of individual uh, proteins that uh, change the epigenet epigenome. So uh, histonacetylases and things like that. And that is kind of what we have been doing with the sirtuin study, uh, uh, story, I mean, you know, where people have been activating sirtuins. And while sirtuins doing all kinds of things in the cell, one of their major things is changing the acetylation state of uh, the histones. I'm not saying this is a better solution than mm. the... Yamanaka expression, but you know, it's an alternative possibility. Sure, and that's that's where we come in with uh, certain supplements, right? Like nicotinamide riboscides, uh, yep. which, Ooh. which, what? Oh, dear, don't get me started on nicotinamide riboside. Well, um, okay, elevated NAD levels, let's just keep it that. Yeah, way. that that that's a All good, right. that's that's good. I mean, you know, certainly some of the stuff uh, by David uh, Sinclair has been impressive, um, you know, some good results. But then don't forget NAD also influences uh, genomic repair. Of course. We There's know things, that, yeah. we, we know it does because it, it, it actually binds to this, oh, I can't remember, the, the, there's, a, there's a certain molecule that it binds to. Basically what happens is <clears throat> this, this problem molecule binds uh, to NAD and it stops it locking in with a with a DNA repair molecule. So, so by increasing NAD, um, it, it it actually facilitates better the repair. I wrote about this on the on the leaf site, but yeah, NAD is intrinsically um, part of DNA repair, and that's why I'm quite excited about uh, David's studies to see if it will translate to humans because if we can stimulate actual proper you know sensible amounts of nad in the cell that's a great thing and can help actually in fact potentially address the uh, genomic instability issue yeah, and nad of course is a universal molecule throughout mm. life used for you know facilitating redox reactions yeah and for electron transport right amongst the other um, molecules that so having more nad gets the electron transport train flowing more 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 um, efficiently, generates ATP more efficiently. Um, it's essentially what happens when you take you know, B vitamins, right? So you're, you're, you're basically trying to, you know, um, improve the efficiency of your mitochondria. So NAD is a very crucial, central, like ATP metabolite that's in, in, in every cell on planet Earth. Yeah, and there's also... Uh good data to suggest that it also helps mitochondria repair themselves as well so yeah. it's pretty important and the fact that the fact that your ATP levels and NAD levels fall when you get older you know your energy levels start to flag it's a big it's a big clue and I mean you know obviously I won't go into the merits of specific supplements and um, and, and potentially bias studies but NAD taken in its in, in its raw fo form is is such a Swiss Army knife um, yeah a molecule. So you know it's no doubt about it. It's being important. Yeah. The problem it is one one way of fixing genomic instability potentially. Yeah, and that's what and and unfortunately I don't we can't really it's not very bioavailable in its raw form. So we have to. That's why people are are looking for supplements that are further upstream that we could get the NAD levels indirectly to go up. Uh, what do you guys? Think about uh, the T4 and the nuclease for DNA repair. I haven't given it much thought. Yeah, you know? but I mean, uh, it's uh, I mean, they use it for children with uh, uh, Xeroderma pigmentosum. You know, the children who are like extremely sensitive to sunlight because the they the they don't repair their DNA after exposure. Mm -hmm. But it seems to be slowing certain aspects 
uh, of aging. So, uh, but I'm not really aware that it has been used by normal people. Yeah, by now. I have. I, can you tell me more about that therapy? I'm I'm actually not aware of that therapy. That sounds really interesting. Well, I mean, it, it uh, repairs uh, uh, the uh, pyrimidine uh, dimers in the DNA, right? Uh, which uh, uh, or of course affected by ultraviolet radiation, which leads to photo aging. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, it seems to reverse that on a, on a molecular level, so it prevents skin cancer from uh, occurring. Mm -hmm. So how do they deliver this? It's uh, you're talking about an enzyme, right? Yeah. Yes. It's a, a liposomal delivery. Right, but but xeroderma pigmentosa. That, from my understanding, that that's predominantly a problem on the skin, right? Because of exposure to UV light. So you have it all, you have lesions all over the body. Yes. So are, are they somehow transfecting skin, skin cells with this? Uh, with this yeah, it's like, a, it's like a, a cream. Oh, really? Just like a normal skin cream. I, I have to check that out. I'm actually, I'm, I'm not, a, um, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So uh, what I think is, uh, that uh, uh, I think I know it has been uh, on uh, FDA. So I think. Uh, How long have they been doing this? This sounds really intriguing. I, I really, I'm really going to read more about this. Since 2005, so it's quite oh. a long time ago, actually. So, yeah, I've been out of the loop on that. All right. Yeah. Very interesting. So essentially, they they call it actually the morning after cream some researcher because you could repair the sun damage that you hmm. have accumulated during the day from it. Very interesting. Awesome. I love it when I learn something I don't know. Um, it's like a new horizon has been opened. Okay. Um, let's see. Something in the chat. Our colleagues from Community self experiment Project. Epitalon tetrapeptide has a good potential as a GR protector. I don't know. Does anybody know about uh, this tetrapeptide? Al um, alanine, was it al alanine, glutamine, aspartic acid, glycine? It has a good potential as a GR protector. So some people are self experimenting with peptides. Yeah, peptides not really in my wheelhouse, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. I honestly don't know. You know, I don't. I don't know um, if it has a good protector as a, a potential as a Jira protector. Um, to be quite honest, I'm not even sure exactly what it's supposed to be doing. What is it supposed to be doing? Well, I have heard about it and it uh, has been around I think for a very long period of time it was mostly Russian scientists who have been for like 20 30 years experimenting with various types of peptides but um, I've never really looked into it and I also never really you know found out what the expected targets are for these peptides mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it is it is plausible. I mean, look at the recent experiment with Foxo Dry um, for Senalytics. I'm sure you guys have heard of that one uh, a few months ago in, I think it was Holland. And they used a type of peptide to actually kill sen uh, senescent cells. It was uh, Foxo Dry. Did you hear about that one, uh, Oliver? No, sorry. I was actually reading a little bit about Epitalon <laughs> when you were talking and trying to fill myself in. Yeah, Epitalon's been around for uh, quite a while. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it, possible peptides can can work in, in those ways, but it does depend obviously on the on the target. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not something I've looked into a great deal. Uh, it's supposed to stimulate uh, expression of uh, telomerase uh, okay. hormonally through its, uh, via the pineal gland. Okay, well, I mean, you know, that has some potential. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, telling me is, uh, aren't they the next format we're going to talk about, actually? Are they? Um, 
Okay, so mm. sorry to leave everybody hanging for, for the uh, epitalon tetrapeptide for an answer. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's, it's, it's uh, very helpful or beneficial. It's been around since the 80s from what I uh, see, my quick cursory glance. So there ought to be a lot of data right on it if it's been around that long. Um, it's a rather simple molecule, um, but um, I haven't heard too much about... Uh, about uh, beneficial effects in humans doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I just, I just happened. Um, okay, so let's go to. Sorry. Wheel of fortune. Yes. Uh, where did I put my hallmarks of aging? Let me just uh, close this. I'm sure it's telomeres next from memory. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Ah, here it is. Close this, share screen, and here we are. Okay. Ah, uh, Laura, Laura, one of our uh, leaf, leaf volunteers says, uh, some peptide complexes reduce inflammation, which could be used as a protective or restorative agent in medicine. Uh, C uh, I M S A I D. I am uh, okay. Yeah. Definitely uh, makes sense. They, yeah, I mean, they do talk you know. about yeah. Anti-inflammatories are are also a big thing, right? They are. So, yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, inflammation is a, a huge part of aging, and it kind of links almost everything together. Mm -hmm. You know, stem cell rejection um, has been found to be uh, reduced if you reduce in inflammation. Uh, all sorts of things, uh, immune system dysfunction, almost, almost every single one of these hallmarks is, is linked in some way to inflammation. Yeah. And, uh, what, one of the things you'll see is, uh, is, uh, NFKB popping up all the time because it's the master regulator of inflammation. So you can't read a, a paper about aging without NFKB popping up mm -hmm. It's everywhere. But it's not the cause of aging. Some people think it is. Mm -hmm. But inflammation, yeah, it's plausible. Reducing inflammation um, it is a good idea. And in, in, in uh, studies, there was a, a, a 2015 mm -hmm. study in Newcastle University. And they showed that uh, people that live over 100 tend to have far lower levels of inflammation than, you know, normal average people that only live to sort of about 80. So inflammation is definitely, definitely a uh, part of it, Again, a big part of it. Did you also see the Cantos trial where it's used this uh, uh, canakinumab uh, and they reduced the, the amount of heart disease with 50% something and cancer with 30% something. The big Cantos uh, uh, trial, uh, has anyone read it? I've heard of that. Mm. It's, it's interesting. That's why I'm very excited about senolytics because they are suppressing one of the main sources of inflammation. Not the only one, but I can uh, add it here. Uh, it's from Novartis. So okay. it's interesting. I and know a few, right? you know, Let me, <laughs> sorry. A few um, years ago, there was also. A study with a specific inhibitor of NF kappa B in fruit flies, if I remember correctly, mm. where uh, lifespan was extended. Yeah, and of is. course, you know, aspirin is also inhibiting not NF kappa B but COX2, which is in the lipid pathway of inflammation, lipid mediators, and um, that also shows uh, uh, extended lifespan uh, in mice and you know has multiple health benefits in humans. So I just posted the paper, um, Victor, that you uh, put the link to. So that's uh, if anybody wants to look that up. Um, anti-inflammatory therapy with mob, which um, MAB to me suggests it's an antibody, I think. Yeah, I've, right? see, I've seen this. I've seen this. I, have, I wrote about this. I recognize the drug. Yep. Yeah. Therapeutic monoclonal antibody targeting interleukin-1 beta. All right. Yeah. So it's all, all about... It's all about essentially it's all about reducing inflammation to a manageable point we need some inflammation for wound mm -hmm. healing but it's when it gets excessive it causes the immune system to become dysfunctional and yeah and all that's, kinds that's of things and that's that's another kind of major um characteristic of aging is that, that 
you're in a chronic state of inflammation, um, a low level kind of uh, state, um, which certainly senescent cells contribute to. Um, so I believe we, we covered, so in this wheel that we have here, we could kind of, uh, let's see. Here. There we are. Too many windows open on this thing. Uh, so on this wheel, we we skipped. We already went over epigenetic alterations, I believe. We talked quite a lot about that and genomic instability. So uh, we skipped over telomere attrition, um, and I think we can kind of briefly talk about that, of course. Oh, um, Actually, I think we, talk we, did talk, we did talk about telomeres because I, I mentioned TPO. Oh, yeah, we did. We yeah, did. we did. We did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I guess a lot of what a lot of people probably will have questions with is, should we be extending our telomeres? Um, what's really in intriguing is that, um, so um, I don't want to go into the whole story of, of telomeres and, you know, and how they were uh, discovered and, and how telomerase was discovered. Uh, Elizabeth Blackburn is, you know, one of the principals who won a Nobel Prize and, you know, her and Carol Greider um, did all the, basically, disco basically discovered the mechanisms of how telomerase works as well as how, how alt works. So they pretty much nailed um, everything uh, using, uh, I believe, uh, tetrahymena and then later uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, so, uh, she, you know, the research, it's interesting that telomeres don't just kind of shrink as we go older, but, but in certain environmental, beneficial environmental effects, um, exercise, so on and so forth, can cause your telomeres to regrow. Yeah. Um, so, it's, there's, a, so there's, it, there's a dynamic there. So just because your telomeres are short doesn't mean they will stay short. So um, I'm not, you know, too familiar. I, I don't know how, if, how much is really known about this, you know, the signaling that's taking place between, you know, the environmental uh, stimuli that you're, you're getting and, you know, the dynamics of telomeres uh, and telomere maintenance. Uh, uh, there are certain compounds out there um, I don't know them off the top of the head, my head, but you know that people purport that you take them and they're going to extend your telomeres. Astragalus uh, roots, one uh, one of them. Uh, maybe I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. There's like there's quite a few supplements that are claimed to to do it. Um, I'm going to say that the evidence, the data is is shaky at best. Uh, and to go back to your question, do we really want to lengthen telomeres and somatic cells? I would say probably not. It's probably a bad idea because, as you, as you alluded to earlier, the entire point of telomeres is, or one of the, 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 the reasons we have them is, it's a, it's a safety feature, it's a, it's a fail-safe, and it allows aged and potentially mutated or damaged cells to be removed from circulation. So if you do lengthen telomeres on old cells that are damaged, then you're keeping old old damaged cells in the in in the cell cycle, mm -hmm. and that doesn't particularly sound like a good idea because if 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 it's got a mutation, it can then divide mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And that, you know, I think it's a bad idea but in, in general. But in mouse but, in mouse studies, didn't um, I don't. I don't. I know that they made many, many mouse variants that you know had telomerase constitutively expressed, and um, they tended to do well. Were, were there any problems? I can't remember. This may have been Ron DePino from Harvard. I, I don't remember. It could have been the, that. Has Depends the on office. the cell type in mice as well, because um, quite a lot of cells in mice express telomerase all the time. Yeah. Um, not all of them, and and that's not the case, but quite a lot of them do. But then that people tend to figure that because mice are so short lived anyway, it's not really an issue to have it have it switched on mm. all the time. With us, obviously, uh, cancer is a concern because of how long we live. So it, it's a fail safe, really. Um, honestly, I'm I'm going to take the sort of sense thought on that and say that it's better to just get rid of old damaged cells and and bring in new you know new cells rather than trying to you know, cheat the cycle and keep keep things operating that shouldn't be operating. 
that's that's my take. And I, I, I honestly, honestly don't think it's a good well, idea. Another question I have, it's very general. Um, I mean, do we even know if all of your somatics, well, first of all, we don't even know all the somatic stem cells that there are extent in your body, but do we even know the connection between telomerase expression and somatic stem cells? Are, you know, are all of them expressing telomerase? Is it on all the time? Is it on only when they switch on into mitosis? Is like, what's the deal? I mean, how, what's, what's the, where is it active? I, you know, yes, sure, somatic stem cells, but when and how often and do they all express telomerase? I wouldn't, I wouldn't know about all, but certainly a lot of them seem to, yeah. and uh, and they they seem to maintain their telomeres at um, you know a sort of reasonable length. But again, even stem cells eventually lose lose enough telomeres, so they stop they stop working. Um, Irina Conboy's work talks about how the signaling environment actually stops things like tert expression and it would apply to stem cells too mm -hmm. so as you get older and older and the inflammation builds up things like tgf beta and uh, nfkb our old friend il6 all of these things once they get to a critical level they they prevent stem cell mobility and stop the stem cells working at all anyway and so they can't anyway mm. they, they literally inhibit tert mm. which is the gene that's required along with tert mm -hmm. to express telomerase so even if they don't and i suspect that most stem cells probably do have the capacity to express telomerase other factors build them and and prevent them doing so and um we should also remember that uh some of the uh, components of telomerase uh Earth, I think, has also other activities inside the cell other than uh, telomerase, uh, telomere lengthening. So, for example, it has been shown to be involved in the beta-catenin pathway. Um, it, it, it's also uh, uh, during stress, it gets, uh, uh, it translocates to the mitochondria. I don't know what it does there, but, you know, uh, apparently, you know, uh, if we would activate telomerase, we may see effects that we might not expect. Yeah, okay. exactly. So it, it's actually regulated within cell cycle uh, within within cell cycle factors. I remember there was a paper. Uh, it was. Oof, I was gonna. Uh, was Amy Wagers, the the lab that does some of the. Uh, parabiosis studies. I know she had an earlier paper that tried to track, and I don't think there's a follow-up, but they tried to isolate. I thought it was kind of ingenious. Um, uh, try to connect the promoter for telomerase to GFP and have a transgenic mouse to see um, if they can isolate um, where are all the telomerase expressing cells in a mouse um, and specifically look for uh, somatic stem cells and um i remember they 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 found it wasn't really a very extensive study they did you know there was a lot of tissue sectioning but you know and they found some some expressing in the intestine and other locations mm -hmm. but um i'm surprised that nobody has re-explored that because i think that would be rather interesting there is actually a paper by blasco that looks at uh, telomerase expression in mice uh -huh. I'll, uh, but I'll have to fish. Yeah, but localization of, of particular cells throughout the, you know, as sort of a proxy to see if, if it correlates with somatic stem cells. So, yeah. So, conclusion, I think uh, essentially with t uh, telomeres and to go back to the, the Belmont study with epigenetics and the Blasco study in January, when they reset the epigenetics in living animals, it reset the telomeres as well, if you recall. Mm -hmm. Yes. My, so my take on the situation is we probably don't need to do anything with telomeres at all because they seem to adjust depending on the situation. And yeah. if we fix the epigenome, there is quite a good chance as preclinical studies and uh, you know cell line data tells us
and ISPSC uh, cells, it shows that it resets the telomeres in them anyway. So whilst they're important, I think they're only important within the domain of, you know, where tissues have experienced accelerated aging, as we spoke about earlier. So, you know, uh, certain organs in, in diabetics, for example, might have critically short telomeres or you get the idea. I think, honestly, if we fix the epigenome, we've got a good chance of fixing the, uh, the telomeres anyway because it will pull them along with it. Yeah, my, my, my take on this, sorry, I was just going to, my take on this is that uh, telomeres are certainly important, um, but if you have, uh, I believe, if you, if you have chronic uh, overexpression or just con constitutive overexpression of telomerase, it's not going to stop you from aging. Um, if, if you have no telomerase, that you're going to have your cell population collapse. If you have telomerase on all the time, let's say no other bad things happen, um, other things, as we see in the hallmarks of aging, will, will degrade. So one, one kind of very simple example is, is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, it undergoes replicative uh, you know, aging. Uh, it, the cells themselves grow old and die. Um, there's nothing wrong with their telomeres. Um, you know, so if you delete telomerase and you delete all pathways, the population is going to collapse. Um, so you certainly need telomeres and telomerase. However, if you have telomeres and telomerase, they're still going to age, right? So. Uh, I was thinking, how will you explain the fact that uh, uh, Blasco's mice live 20-25% longer? What will cause that life extension to occur? Well, I mean, I, I personally think it was what, what I mentioned earlier in the fact that how telomeres contribute to the epigenome uh, via the TPE effect, because they do influence gene expression. So that would be that would be why I, I, I believe that they, um, they do extend lifespan, because it's helping with epigene, uh, epigenetic stability. So it's going to have some effect. Okay. That would be my guess. Anybody else got anything? That's, yeah. Uh, um, sounds good to me. Uh, I, I can't think of, uh, you know, can't think of anything else on this subject. Um, although I'm sure there's tons more, but we, our time is limited and we yeah. have many more hallmarks to go. So let's go on to... Drum roll, please. The protein folding, loss of proteostasis. Uh. Um, <clears throat> so misfolded proteins. Um, and whenever I think of misfolded proteins, I think of Alzheimer's, right? I, I yeah. think that's, that's most people, that's on most people's mind, no, no, no pun intended. Uh, so proteins I just alluded to earlier are, you know, obviously uh, the business end of cells. Uh, they form structural structures in cells. They form, uh, uh, they catalyze things. Their proteins help other proteins fold. Proteins maintain the genome stability. They pretty much do everything, in, you know, in conjunction with uh, ribonucleic acids. Uh, so you clearly need them to be in optimal functional state. And uh, proteins are a very complex three-dimensional molecule. So um, depending on what sort of protein it is, it could be more prone to instability um, than other proteins. And things that can destabilize a protein are, um, as shown in this figure three, uh, one is uh, elevated temperature. Uh, what's ER stress? I'm missing that. Endogenous and exogenous stress, it's just general stress. Hmm. Um, well, anyway, there's there's a lot of things that can misfold a protein. Wrong pH, for example, uh, heat shock, uh, oxidative stress, chem chemical modifications on proteins that shouldn't be there. Um, point mutations, uh, for example. Uh, so if you have, um, uh, I believe, an acidic amino acid being changed to a hydrophobic amino acid, that's a point mutation that leads to sickle cell anemia, and that causes a misfolding of hemoglobin. So um, not just aging, but certainly certain diseases are, classic diseases are a result of misfolded proteins. So once a protein becomes unfolded, uh, different things could happen. Um, you don't want it to remain unfolded because then it could, all the way on the right, lead to aggregation. And aggregation is what happens when you fry an egg. 
So if you crack an egg on a skillet and uh, all that albumin protein, which is water soluble and globular, uh, stretches out, unfolds, and then basically all those hydrophobic groups that are exposed tend to glom onto other groups that are exposed and you get, uh, you get your fried egg. Uh, so you don't want these clumps and those clumps are very hard for cells to get rid of. And um, that's, you know, and certainly in, in uh, the disease that's been studied, probably the, the, the best when it comes to protein aggregation is, is Alzheimer's because it's, uh, it seems that it's, uh, these aggregates are not just uh, correlative, but strongly suggested that they're causative of neurotoxicity, uh, such as amyloid plaques. Um, so the cell before that happens has several ways to get rid of these unfolded proteins. Um, one is chaperone mediated folding which basically are uh, other enzymes that help basically um, refold catalytically a protein back to its normal shape. Um, and they basically provide an environment where the, where the protein can essentially um, remake new um, intermolecular bonds. Um, if that can't happen, uh, the protein has to be destroyed. And one kind of uh, major way that proteins are destroyed in the cell is through uh, another giant protein complex called the proteasome. Um, and it, proteins that are misfolded are tagged uh, by a pathway of enzymes uh, that adds these um, little, uh, little pro other little protein groups called ubiquitins. Um, so they add these ubiquitin chains. And these uh, UB groups basically um, dock with proteasomes and cause it to be basically taken up and chopped ba up back into amino acids and recycled. Um, also, you can have uh, uh, something known as autophagy, which is um, basically self-eating, right? So if proteins are misfolded, um, and autophagy can take in big things too, I believe, you know, damaged mitochondria as well. Um, so basically, these, uh, these vesicles form and they, are, uh, they direct these misfolded proteins to uh, lysosomes, which is where most of the... Um, digestive enzymes of the cell are located. And interestingly, um, I don't have the study um, on the top of my head right now. I don't really remember the authors, but I believe there's probably more than one study that shows that um, when you starve yourself, when you undergo fasting, um, it increases autophagy or elevates rates of autophagy in the body. Um, so that could be, you know, one kind of major benefit, one kind of at the biochemical level, um, you know, reason why you have benefits from um, fasting and dietary restriction is you have elevated autophagy levels, which helps clear up some of this damage. Um, so certainly loss of proteostasis, loss of the cell's ability to carry out these um, uh, functions to reverse these effects as uh, uh, a problem that increases with, with aging. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and kind of um, point the camera on everybody else. Uh, before, I guess we can talk more about details of, of uh, proteostasis, but um, uh, I'm interested, obviously there's a lot of people that are interested in, in diseases that lead to dementia, such as Alzheimer's. And there's a lot of research, very interesting research taking place now to see um, how these plaques, how these misfolded aggregates can be cleared. Um, and there's a lot of stuff out there that seems to be in the category of generally recognized as safe. And, um, and uh, I find to be very intriguing as, as to, you know, um, what it could potentially do to, you know, increase the clearance of some of these aggregates. Um, one thing that I think people have uh, discussed is um, making the blood-brain barrier a bit more permeable to macrophages to clear up these plaques. And one, one uh, technique that's being studied right now is through the use of um, ultrasound uh, as, as a means to achieve that. That's relatively safe. Um, and it seems to, in certain um, animal models, seems to increase the clearance of plaques and also, not just you know as a correlation, but the the mice um, have improved um, memory and have improved performance in, in certain um, functional tests. 
Uh, another intriguing thing, and I'm just tossing these out there, stuff that I've read. Um, one thing that intrigues me, and I haven't read too much about it um, too often in the news, but I've seen a couple of papers. Um, so there's an uh, IL-33, which is an interleukin, which is uh, basically uh, an, a chemokine that stimulates uh, uh, blood cells. And in this case, it stimulates um, them to um, take up, basically um, activates macrophages. So injections of, of IL-33, which is a naturally occurring interleukin in mice, uh, this one paper uh, seemed to suggest a 50% improvement in uh, functional tests uh, in mice. And this was only a few weeks of injections. Um, and again, this is something that levels of IL-33 are also known to go down in humans as well um, over time. Um, and the third therapy that is also kind of making the rounds. Uh, Li Wei Sai, who's at Harvard Medical School. Um, there's this intriguing um, work that suggests um, oscillations of stimuli, such as 40 hertz oscillations of light. Um, if brain cells oscillate for some reason at that frequency, um, and this is done through, you know, this is through uh, just flashing light, um, that somehow induces clearance of plaques. Um, don't know the mechanism specifically, but the suggestion is it's not something just due to light, but it could be any kind of 40 hertz oscillatory response that's picked up as a, as a stimulus. So it could be a tone, right? Or it could be a vibration. Um, and that seems to propagate throughout the brain. And uh, that's all of these things I've just mentioned now seem to be, and also certain dietary effects as well. All of these things I find very, very fascinating um, because these uh, seem to have little or no side effects. So if they don't work, they don't work, but they seem to be low hanging fruit that can be tested um, quite readily. Yep, the one I've got my eye on is uh, GAIM, G-A-I-M, mm -hmm. and it's been in development for a number of years. Uh, heavily funded by Michael J. Fox Foundation, mm -hmm. and it stands, stands for General Amyloid Interaction Motif. And um, it's, it's a very interesting therapy because it can actually munch its way through a number of uh, aggregates, including um, the ones that are associated with uh, Alzheimer's, uh, ALS, Parkinson's, and uh, amelioidosis, which is, as Victor knows, the one that tends to get people who live over 100 and affects the organs themselves rather than the brain. I'm sure, sure Victor will have something to say about that, amelioidosis. He might do. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, transtyrosine amelioidosis is by uh, far the most common death uh, among people over 110. Uh, and uh, also 25% of people aged 85 have clinical uh, re relevant deposits in their hearts. So I think that's a very underestimated cause of uh, cardiac failure in the, in the elderly. We, everyone knows of atherosclerosis, but few people think of how common amyloidosis is. Mm. And in fact, Oliver, just to tie it in, uh, Robert uh, Schmuckler-Rice, who's just joined our uh, SAB, mm -hmm. recently did a study about amyloids and uh, aggregates in particular. And he asked the same question. Is, is the formation of misfolded proteins, is it a general sort of aspect of aging or just unique to like the brain and, you know, a few organs? And he's got uh, research uh, results recently uh, published that show that they, there are amyloids even forming in muscle tissue and other mm -hmm. tissues and things like that. So the general loss of proteostasis is affecting the body, you know, on, a, on, a, on multiple mm -hmm. tissues, you know, not just just the brain. It's affecting all kinds of tissues. I expect there's probably amyloids for nearly all the sorts of tissues you can think of because at its core it's the loss of um, proteostasis that's the problem right and it's it's 
it's not just and it's not just uh, not just um, you know misfolded proteins, right? Then mm. you might have also aggregates of things like lipofusin, which is which is uh, misformed or oxidized lipids that are mm. basically can't be handled by lysosomes, and um, and that's you know I think visually isn't that one of the one of the components of what they call age spots on your on your skin, right? So so I I'm leaning towards you know I. I think that may be a, actually a general effect that, you know, you could probably find, you know, uh, these types of mis misfoldings um, in many cell types, but um, in certain cell types, the uh, physiologic, um, you know, effect uh, is going to be more pronounced, right? So if you have a neuropathy, right, that's going to be more pronounced than having age spots as far as, uh, you know, as, as far as a noticeable physiologic outcome that's negative so it hasn't been characterized as a simple it's a it's sim, quite simply uh, so the evidence um in in this paper i mentioned suggests that it it, it has a, a role in sarcopenia which is muscle wastage mm. which is very interesting you know as you say there, there's there's probably all kinds of non-characterized conditions caused by misfolded proteins and you know liposomes and all sorts. Yeah. Uh, I so, want to point out what about the uh, uh, lipofuscin in the skin that would it really cause age spots? I, I feel I mean that's like a hypothesis or is there any like a clinical uh, thing that we have because I mean it's a dysregulation of melanin but uh, it's really related to amyloid. I have not heard anything about that. Uh, I'm sure it discolors heart um, heart tissue. Um, lipofusin. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong about the eight spots, but I thought maybe maybe I misread that lipofusin was a component. But let me just double check the power of Google. But <laughs> so I, down this wheel. I mm -hmm. think I have here we that as well yeah. that everyone says lipofusin eight spots. But then maybe if you start looking in the literature, you, it turns out that the evidence for that is maybe not that strong. Yeah, so it's like it's maybe like a yeah. common delusion. Again, I don't know. Okay, I will check that out. Um, oh, will it come through? Okay. Right yeah. Um, I'm just pulling up a paper on just Let's random paper a from, from NCBI. Um, advances in dermatology and allergy allergology. Allergy law? I can't pronounce that. Something to do with allergies. But Melanin and lipofusin as hallmarks of skin aging. Yeah. So probably both. Yeah, right? I have not heard that lipofusin would be like mm. clinically visible it's looking like age spots. I have not. Mm. Lipofuscin can build up in certain um, uh, tissues like uh, big motor neurons, I think it is, yeah. uh, up to like over 50% of cell volume yeah. uh, in very old people. So to me, that kind of indicates it must cause problems. I mean, if 50% of your cell is full with lipofuscin, yeah. Yeah. you know, even if it doesn't do anything, just by sitting in the way of, uh, you know, uh, organelle transport or, you know, preventing the diffusion of molecules in your cells, it must have negative health benefits. But, um, you know, lipofuscin kind of is not included in uh, the hallmarks of aging paper. Uh, you could argue it falls under proteostasis, it, but it's basically a, a product form that, um, you know, when your lysosomes fail, to clear aggregated proteins. It's like the waste junk leftover, uh, highly cross-linked material. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's certainly not doing any good, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Steve, yeah. So Steve just mentioned we may have to do Hallmarks Part 2 at this rate. Um, I was about to just comment. It's getting close to yeah. 3 o'clock, and uh, I do have a lecture to give, actually, a little past 3 um, and I would, it would be a shame to rush through the next half. And we are about halfway through, which means at this rate, it will be 5 p.m., if not longer, by the time we yeah. finish. 
So um, I think I think we should wrap up what we're discussing right now, and I think we should prepare to have maybe sooner than a month uh, a, a Hallmarks Part Two, yeah. um, where we go through the rest and then basically wrap everything up in in a, in a tidy um, commentary that uh, hopefully connects it all together. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it is a big subject. I mean, this is age and it's incredibly complicated yeah. and we're only sort of touching the surface. But as you say, I think it would be a shame to, to race through it. Especially and, since you know, the next, sorry to cut you off, especially yeah. since the next thing we're about to talk about is insulin signaling. And, you know, and that's a kind of uh, complicated bit of steps there. But isn't it just caloric restriction, Oliver? <laughs> Everything is tied to caloric restriction. All of those, all every hormone could be affected by CR. It's all CR all the way. I'm just kidding. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it is. It is. I was obviously being a bit glib there because it's some. It's something that some people sometimes say when they, when they look at deregulated nutrient sensing and they they dismiss it as um, oh, it's just CR in it. Well, no, not really. Um, there's four pathways and lots of fun, but it is a downstream effect. That's probably um, you know something we need to look at is the uh, the hierarchy because uh, the wheel we've talked about the wheel but they actually go on later and we'll talk about it later the hierarchy and what's what they think is primary mm -hmm. and it's relevant so my opinion of deregulated nutrient sensing is it's very important but I think if you fix the stuff further up the priority chain you may well mitigate it. Because okay. the body knows, knows what it wants to do, so fix the core reasons. But but we'll talk about it, and you know, it's a pet peeve of mine. So yes, we will. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, next uh, next time around, the wheel will keep turning, <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure when um, when it's going to turn next. Maybe in a week, maybe two weeks. We'll we'll have that figured out. Um, and uh, I think we'll do it on a Tuesday, same time, right? That works for me. I could do that, but you know, I'm I'm fairly flexible. Okay, so that was. Um, I I hope uh, everybody that was listening in got something out of it. I certainly learned a few things along the way that I haven't uh, I haven't uh, known before. That's what it's all about. Um, and I hope people that have been listening but not giving any questions uh, could think about it a little bit more and come up with more questions for. Uh, for next time around when we finish part two of Hallmarks of Aging. So thanks, everybody, and uh, stay tuned. Yeah, thanks for everybody who's joined us. And, uh, yeah, it's great. And uh, just just to let you all know that Journal Club runs thanks to the uh, support of our patrons, uh, Lifespan Heroes, and if you'd like to find out how you can support us, you can uh, belong to... Uh, like, uh, www.lifespan.io forward slash hero and find out how you can get involved and uh, thanks very much thanks guys so yep we'll see you next time and thanks very much for joining us everybody thank you everyone. awesome bye bye take care bye. guys take care